Well, um, today's passage is uh, from chap- John chapter 4, verses 1 to 30. Uh, it is a long passage. Uh, just allow me to read, and uh, for congregation, you may remain seated and just listen to the Word of God being read out. Jesus and the woman of Samaria. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had learned that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria, and so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of this water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. All fathers worship on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. And when He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Just then His disciples came back. They marveled that He was talking with a woman. But no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather here today to hear your word and to remember what your son did on the cross. So Father, even as I preach your word, grant us the wisdom and understanding to listen to this message. And I just pray that you will stir in us a desire to know you more and deeper. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of heart today be found acceptable in your sight. All this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So last week, Pastor Adrian preached on uh, Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this coming Sunday on Easter, we will hear Pastor Rick preach about the official who sought Jesus out to heal his son. And so from a narrative standpoint, we notice that this meeting with the Samaritan woman is recorded in between two other conversations with two men. Both of these men were high-ranking and powerful men. And there cannot be a starker contrast to this nameless Samaritan woman. You know, what is most curious, and it is hardly coincidental that this 
It's the longest dialogue recorded between Jesus and any single person. And yes, this includes the conversations recorded with his disciples. And so who is this woman of Samaria that seems so unimportant, but yet received so much attention from Jesus? You know, even just reading these 30 verses, we don't really know much about this woman, right? Uh, we know that, uh, sorry, we do not know her name, neither does John reveal any of her physical attributes. We know her gender for sure, right? And we know that she lives in a town called Sychar, uh, which is found in Samaria. What we can assume is that she is probably a social outcast as she comes to draw water from the well during the hottest time of the day, which is atypical of what the town folks usually do. So there must be something wrong or something at, at issue with her. Now, as we listen to the conversation between Jesus and her, we also find out that she has been married five times and the woman that she's now living with is not her husband. Now, if this was a movie, I can imagine the lyrics of a Taylor Swift song playing in the background. So all of you Swifties, I'm sure you already know what song it is. You know, I knew that you were trouble when you walked in, right? So imagine when the Samaritan woman walking in, this background of this music telling us that there's trouble. This woman is not... Um, a moral person, perhaps. But as most of us are familiar, Jesus has been known to disrupt the norm. Jesus spoke to a woman in public. Even more scandalous is that she's not even family. She's a stranger. You know, I was reading an article on Christianity today that talked about seven different types of Pharisees. So they typecast the different Pharisees based on um, their attributes. And interestingly, there's one kind of Pharisees called the bruised Pharisees. You know why they are bruised? And I kid you not, okay? This is why they are bruised. They are so focused on avoiding looking at women that they bang into the walls. <laughs> right? it, it, it is uh, based on an old uh, document called the Talmud. And so, you see, it was unbecoming of Jesus, a rabbi, to speak to a woman. But you see, it's not just from a Jewish standpoint that, uh, that Jesus' actions are surprising. The woman herself tells him, how is it that you, a Jew, can ask me for a drink, a woman of Samaria? And you know, this is what D.A. Carson, a well-known and respected theologian, he summarised uh, the, the whole situation between uh, the, uh, the, the Samaritans and the Jews. And this is what he says. After the Assyrians captured Samaria, the capital, capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, in 722, uh, BC, they deported all the Israelites of substance and settled the land with foreigners, who then intermarried with the surviving Israelites and adhered to some form of their ancient religion. In other words, they practiced mixed religion. After the exile of the southern kingdom in Babylon, the Jews, when they returned to the homeland, they viewed these Samaritans not only as the children of political rebels, but as racial half-breeds whose religion was tainted by various unacceptable elements. And of course, in 400 BC, the Samaritans erected a rival temple on Mount Gerizim because they did not want to go to Jerusalem, or rather they could not go to Jerusalem to worship God. So you see, it was unbecoming for Jesus, a Jew, to associate with the Samaritans, and even more unacceptable to ask for her help, given the historical animosity between the two nations. It has been observed by some preachers that this tension that we see between the Jews and the Samaritans can be compared to the racial segregation in the US during the 1970s, you know, when the African Americans were discriminated against. But you see, I think that the disdain the Jews had for the Samaritans ran even deeper. It was even more severe because there were multifaceted issues of ethnic, racial, political, and even religious differences. And so the burning question I had was, why did Jesus still choose to speak to her? Why would he risk being unclean? Did he not care about his own reputation? After all, if you think about it, it is probable that this incident happened early in his ministry and it will have dire repercussions for him and his disciples. I believe one of the clues in answering this question lies in verse 4. And he says here that he had to pass through Samaria. While the path through Samaria to Galilee was the shortest and most direct, you can see here on the map, uh, actually this white 
uh, uh, pathway, it is the most direct, it is the shortest. But most Jews, because of the tension, because uh, they were also being attacked by the Samaritans, they choose to take the longer detour. They will actually cross the Jordan River and walk up all the way and here. So he adds another two to three days of the journey. But you see, John, perhaps on hindsight, knew that Jesus was intentional in choosing to cut through Samaria. He knew that Jesus had a divine appointment with this woman. And so when we take a deeper look at the conversation between this unnamed woman and Jesus, we find out the most curious fact about her. And we mentioned this just now, is that she has had five husbands and the one that's living with her, or rather the one that she's living with, is not her husband. Now, we are confused, okay, or at least I am confused. Uh, maybe I'm a very capable person, but the first question I had was, how old is this woman that she could have six relationships? You know, if some of us watch the Chosen series, uh, it's a very nice scene of this, and they portray the woman as a very young lady. Looks to me about 20 plus, 30 years old. <laughs> we don't know. Right? Again, John doesn't reveal to us the physical characteristics or the age. But, but we still have to ask, how on earth did she manage to have six relationships in a period of time? What happened exactly to each of these relationships? And so, unfortunately, neither Jesus nor John reveals what the reasons of each of these divorces could be. We are left to guess. Now, based on Old Testament laws, based on interactions with uh, Jesus and the Pharisees, we, we can guess, right? Perhaps she was unable to bear children. Or she could not satisfy her ex-husbands in a service, whether is it in her hospitality, taking care of the household, or perhaps even sexually. She just couldn't satisfy them. Or, or maybe she was accused of committing adultery just because she spent time or extended time with another man. Or it could be, you know, sometimes the simplest reason could be true, that one or more of her husbands had died. Now, we can only surmise that by trying relationship after relationship, that she really needs this connection. She really needs this relationship with a man. I guess she really seeks fulfillment through these relationships. By continuing to pursue marriage after marriage after marriage, she reveals her quest for a prince that could maybe rescue her, someone who gives give her value, meaning, or maybe even purpose. And I'm certain that there's one thought that she must have had as she tied the knot. This time, this is the man. This time, I will be happy. This time, it will be okay. This time, he will finally accept me for who I am. But you know what? Each time, she was disappointed. After failing five times, she may have become jaded or she have learned her lesson well. And this covenant of marriage has become cheap, meaningless, even worthless. And so she's content with companionship without any official status. So when Jesus points out that, yes, you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband, far from being irrelevant, Jesus' word reveal a deep-seated loneliness, a hole in the heart that no man could feel. For years, she drank from the well of relationships, hoping to find satisfaction for her thirsty soul. Her struggle is not unique to her, nor is this an antiquated concept. It is still certainly true for each and every one of us here today. We are plagued by insatiable desire to fill that unfillable hole in our hearts. We are tormented by discontent. We want to have more and more, and more. When can there ever be enough? We try our best to fill that unfillable hole. And this deep-seated desire has misled many. In pursuit of it, we climb the career ladder and accumulate greater wealth and possessions. We upgrade from HDB to EC to condos. We buy a car bigger and bigger. We buy more branded stuff we accumulate greater wealth and possessions. Or maybe some of us are drawn to the seduction of power and seek to consolidate it, whether at the workplace or at home. And still others chose 
momentary delights only to find that it does not last. How meaningless are these things that we fill our hearts with? To try to quench our thirst with the things of this world is like shipwrecked sailors who thirst and drink of the ocean. I have a little bit of experience with this, having been in the Navy for two years and having gone from a few kayaking expeditions here and there. When you are so thirsty, when you have ran out of that water in your water bottle, you look at the sea around you and you wish you could drink. You wish that you can quench your thirst. But you see, the more you drink the seawater, the thirstier you will be. And though you can drink more and more of this seawater, finally, you would still die of dehydration. What compels us to hunger and thirst for more seawater, even when we know that it is hazardous to us? C.S. Lewis describes this profound thirst beautifully in his book, Mere Christianity. Most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want, and want acutely, something that cannot be held, that cannot be had in this world. And there are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. The Christian says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger, and well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. Well, there's such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably, Earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but merely to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. And if that is so, I must take care on the one hand never to despise or to be unthankful for these earthly blessings, but on the other, never mistake them for something else of which they are only a kind of a copy, an echo, a mirage. Friends, this insatiable desire that we have points to an immaterial uh, thing. And as we have all experienced, the vanity of earthly things can only point to a spiritual desire. We are spiritual beings made for a relationship with God. Sin has caused us to be separated from Him. This unfillable hole in our hearts is actually a God-shaped vacuum that no man or woman nor possessions can ever feel. We have all attempted to fill this God-shaped heart in our hearts with things of this earth. Some drink from the wells of success or materialism or pleasure or power or relationships. We have all tried these things and found that it is still lacking. And so today, as we hear Jesus' words, what a comfort it is for us. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of, the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus promises that this living water would fill the unfillable hole in our heart. It will quench the insatiable desire. But you know, even as we read the text, we know that the Samaritan woman has not gotten it. She has not understood. She is still looking at physical water. Her reply in verse 12 tells us that this scene between Jesus and her, occurs at Jacob's well. She even reminds Jesus that despite the many differences between Jews and Samaritans and the hostility that resulted from them, the two nations actually share the same ancestor, Jacob. But because of what happened in the past, the Samaritans only accepted the first five books of the Hebrew Scripture and they rejected everything else. So, knowing this, I wonder which she would have been very familiar with the stories of Jacob. Would she remember that her forefather, Jacob, also had a very special encounter at a well? Not at this well, but at another one. Did she recall that it was at a well that Jacob met his sweetheart, Rachel? He was the one who rolled the stone from the well's mouth and drew water for her. And this act of chivalry perhaps impressed her. And so, when he revealed that he's her father's relative, 
She hurries back to her family and tells them this news. Jacob then stays with the family. And as we know, there was a time that he had to work and uh, to redeem his wife. And so when it was time for joining in marriage comes, Rachel's father throws a marriage feast and although it was an odd turn of events, both Leah, the elder sister, and Rachel, the younger one, both became Jacob's wives. Jacob's experience at the wells bears a striking resemblance to his parents, Isaac and Rebekah, who also had an experience at the well. Isaac and Rebekah were perhaps the first couple in the Bible whose love story begins at a well. And this is found in Genesis chapter 24. The elderly Abraham sends his servant as a proxy back to the land of his ancestors to find a wife for Isaac. And when the servant arrives at a well, he prays that God will make his journey successful. And you know what? Before he even finishes uh, praying, he encounters Rebekah. She draws water for him. And when she learns who he is, she again hurries back to her family to tell them of the news of this visitor. The servant shares a meal with Rebecca's family and stays with them a few days. And when they return to Isaac's family, uh, Rebecca and Isaac are married. So to those who are familiar with the Old Testament, you may have recognised this pattern of people meeting at a well resulting in marriage. Another incident was a case of Moses and Zipporah. So then a theologian summarised this type scene, sharing that these elements were often present. So the well-meeting type scene is such there will always be someone journeying to a foreign country. The man will encounter a woman at the well and the woman will hurry home to tell of this news of this visitor. And this will result in some form of hospitality. hospitality. The visitor then stays with the woman's family and often there are meals and, uh, for days and feasts. And finally, the two parties will be joined as one. And so you would have realised this is almost exactly how things are unfolding in John chapter 4. The meeting of Jesus with this unnamed, unnamed Samaritan woman foreshadows the gospel, this marriage between Jesus and his bride. On one level, we see that Jesus demonstrates his love for the outcasts, the lowly, the marginalised. He goes out of his way to converse with her. And Jesus knows the full details of her life. Perhaps part immoral, perhaps sordid in nature. But yet, he still offers her this living water that will give her eternal life. Friends, this is amazing and undeserving grace. But on a deeper level, Jesus presents himself as the ultimate groom, the Samaritan who is representative of the other, the non-Jew. He is calling her like he's calling all mankind. And just now Cheryl mentioned to thank God for us non-Jews, we Gentiles, for being brought into this relationship. And in the concluding part of their conversation, Jesus corrects her and says that she and the Samaritans at large will worship, actually worship what they do not know and that salvation is from the Jews. He goes on to describe an incredible future bond between the Jews, the Samaritans, and all true worshippers with the Father. We will all worship in spirit and in truth. It is then that the scales on her eyes are slowly falling. She begins to understand a little clearly what this living water could mean. And she speaks of her anticipation with a fuller understanding she will receive when one day the Messiah comes. And in response, Jesus declares, I who speak to you am him. Jesus identifies himself as the long-awaited Messiah of the Samaritans. And he does so in a language that hints he is God's own presence. This is the same words that Moses heard at a burning bush. The Jewish God who brings the living water of salvation. Now, in a sudden turn, this woman, from whom Jesus earlier asked for a drink, has now found that her thirst for theological understanding is now quenched. She has met the Messiah, the one she has been waiting for, the one that she has been longing for. Perhaps this is the one man who could satisfy her. What a twist 
And this is a, certainly a different kind of marriage bond that we would have expected from the usual type scene of the meeting at the well. In actual fact, John, the author, has prepared the readers for this plot twist. And just a few verses earlier in John, uh, in John chapter 3, verse 29, John the Baptist alludes to Jesus as the bridegroom. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 6 to 8, it carries on this motif by declaring, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and His bride has been made ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And it should not be such a big surprise as God's people has often been depicted as the bride in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are four verses here. I will not read out everything. You can go back home and you can read through and meditate on what it means to be a bride of Jesus. So here we have the true bridegroom, Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Laws, offering a marriage bond not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And so this is good news for us who are not Jews. He pursues both Jews and Gentiles, not because we are pursuable, not because we are beautiful, not because of anything we have done, as we have sung earlier on. Who are we that Jesus would choose us, would pursue us, would want to offer this marriage to us? But it is simply because He is both gracious and merciful, and so, let us consider the Samaritan woman's response to Jesus' revelation. She came to the well to fill up water, to drink of this physical water. But she leaves her water jar behind and returns to her hometown to share her experience with the Messiah, inviting the town folk to come and see if they would reach the same conclusion about him. The Samaritan woman just as the disciples had left their fishing nets, had started her discipleship journey. She has accepted this invitation to drink the living water that Jesus provides and has gone to make other disciples. Now, as I was reflecting on this, and perhaps because I, I just recently did a training on disciple making, I wonder how many of us are actually concerned how little she actually knows about Jesus. She barely knows this person. She has spoken to him maybe five, ten minutes. There's no mention of the four spiritual laws. There was no conversion story in the sense of the, the sinner's prayer. All she says when she goes to, back to the village is, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? It was her own experience with the living, breathing God in human form that made her realise that this is true. It gave her all that she needed to tell of the good news. And her invitation is sincere. It is non-threatening and it's open to everyone, even to the people who have first shunned her, people who have avoided her. But she wanted to share the good news to these people. In the end, we are told in John chapter 4, verse 39, that eventually many Samaritans from the town city believed in him, because of the woman's testimony. You know, incidentally, this is also how Jesus invited his first disciples in John chapter 1, verse 39. It is how Philip also invited Nathanael in verse 46. Come, come, come and see. And even today, friends, this invitation to come and see still stands. Would you come? and see Jesus, the living water? Would you come and see the one who would fill your unfillable heart? Would you come and see the Messiah who would quench your insatiable desires? C.S. Lewis, uh, in the same quote, uh, I left out the last line. He goes on to say this, I must keep myself alive Sorry, I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I will not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to the country and to help others to do the same. 
on this side of eternity, we may still struggle with the desire to fill that unfillable heart with things of this earth. I pray, I pray, and let this be all of our prayers, that C.S. Lewis's desire written over here is our desire as well. Let us keep alive in ourselves the desire for our true country. Let us drink from the living water that only Jesus provides. And so today, as we observe Good Friday, we are reminded of Jesus who was hung on the cross. John chapter 19, verse 28, records another time that Jesus was thirsty. Jesus declared, I thirst. And in verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In case you have missed the irony, the irony is that one who offers living water would choose to submit to torture and physical thirst. He willingly endured the humiliation and the agony of the cross. He suffered a judgment that was worse than any thirst or bodily anguish, relational or even emotional pain that we experience on this side of eternity. The wrath of the Father was finally satisfied through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. The penalty of sin was finally and fully paid. To redeem unworthy people such as us and to offer this gift of marriage to each and every one of us, Jesus was cut off from the most intimate of unions from the Father. What an irony. Friends, dear brothers and sisters, we were made to know God. And until we know Him through Jesus Christ, we are doomed to restlessness and despair. So let us come and see who this Jesus is. And when we accept Jesus' gift of living water, we will find our thirst completely and permanently satisfied. Allow me to pray. And I'm going to pray for different groups of people. And if you identify with any of this group, you can just repeat the same words. You can express the same desires. You can just pray along. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, Triune God of Grace, Father, some of us here gathered today have not accepted Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. We pray for the skills of our spiritual eyes to drop like the Spirit Samaritan woman's. Help us to understand your truths. Help us to accept the invitation to come and see. Let us experience your love and the comfort of your presence, Holy Spirit. Help us to see Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. For those of us who know Jesus, but when we have been tempted to drink from earthly wells, when we have not drunk deeply of your living water, Father, we pray for a renewed thirst for your word and your presence. We repent of our actions. May we be drawn into a deeper intimacy with you, experiencing the fullness of your love and the riches of your grace. Holy Spirit, would you help us to hunger and thirst after your living water. Grant refreshments for our souls. And Lord, for those of us who are already drinking deeply of your living water, we pray that we may bear much fruit and as we experience the overflowing of your love and joy, may we be strengthened to invite others to come and see you. Help us, dear Lord. We pray this in the name of our Son, Jesus Christ.